Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. My name is Matthew, and I'm joined today by TJ. TJ, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Matt. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Very, very good. Uh, TJ is the Chief Commercial Officer and a board member at Phoenixo and Crypto PR. Is that right, TJ? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Tell us a little bit about um, Phoenixo. Yeah. So Phoenixo is actually one of uh, the biggest digital marketing firm uh, currently uh, in the market. Uh, it is not just in the UK or Europe, but it's actually globally. Um, so we have our own over 100 websites. That is our own managed in-house websites. We have a team of over 200 content writers who are basically producing high-quality content on these websites on a day-to-day basis. And combine all of our uh, websites, we do get about 100 million impressions or visits, whatever you want to call them, a month. And oh. we do work with some of the big brands or big names uh, in the industry, ranging from your traditional stockbrokers, stockbrokers, to crypto exchanges, to forex brokers, uh, to iGaming platforms, all over. Some of the names that we've been with, obviously we work with eToro, we work with uh, Bitstamp, we work with Coinbase, we work with um, CMC Markets, we work with Capital.com, and the list just goes on. Incredible. Well, we'll come back to that. We'll learn a little bit more about that, but it sounds like there's a lot of responsibility going on there. A hundred million impressions, that's quite yeah. um, that's quite a volume um, of yeah. people. So, <laughs> wonderful. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit, TJ. And um, what I like to do with these is I like to talk in a sort of circular fashion. And we're going to start off, it's going to be about you. We're going to try and teach our listeners and our viewers a little bit, or maybe not teach them, but try and inspire them, give them some words of wisdom. And somewhere in our conversation, hopefully they can find something um, to use. So I'd like to start off from the beginning. I want to go around to school. We're going to get to know you a little bit. And right. um, I want to know, were you one of the good kids in school? Or were you one of the naughty boys? <laughs> Uh, well, I will definitely say I, I definitely wasn't the good kid. I was right in the middle order. I wasn't even the bad either. Uh, so yeah, we're right in the middle. Uh, it depends on the day, how I'm feeling. If I'm feeling a bit naughty, then yes, I'm going to be out of the class worst of the time because teachers will kick me out. And the others, uh, when I actually want to, the, the subjects I was interested in and in, in studying, I'm in the class, I'm behaving, I'm paying attention to what teachers are teaching. Uh, but yeah, no, I did my schooling in uh, in India. I was born and raised in India. Uh, I'm sure you can probably tell from accent. Uh, been uh, <laughs> I can I can I can talk in my Indian accent if you need me to. But uh, I, so I done my schooling there. And uh, how it started, I actually wanted to be an engineer. Believe it or not, I, I my subjects were physics, chemistry, and maths. Uh, but unfortunately, at my uh, the final year in my school, I I, I failed my physics exam. Uh, which basically took me two uh, retakes to obviously pass it. Uh, by that time, what what happened was all my school friends that actually went into uni, now they're almost coming into year two of the university by the time I just uh, passed my physics exam. And I realized, well, I don't want to be juniors to my mates that I just studied in a class with. And I decided to make a big bold move of deciding and packing everything and just leaving India. Uh, right, okay, I'm going to go to a different country where no one knows me, but no one knows that I failed physics in school, and I'm going to just start everything all over again. Wow. So I came to study diploma in, uh, in a small East London college uh, near Stratford. So that was for one year. After that, I obviously uh, enrolled myself for a, for, a, you know, for a university course, which was the Anglo Ruskin at the Chelmsford campus. So I was there for three years and uh, yeah, so the, the goal was to be an engineer and now I end up in traditional finance, stockbrokers, fintech, marketing and yeah, the list just goes on. That's that's really cool. That's quite crazy. So um, I, would, I want to touch on that a little bit actually. Yeah, um, sure. It's always interesting to hear these stories, especially when you speak about failure because a lot of people speak about it and they say, you know, the road to success is through a lot of failures. And you've brought one up there, and I think it's it was a very very brave move to say, okay, look, you know, this is what's happened. There's you don't want to look at that, you know, and say, oh, that's where I was, that's where I could have been. So, 
what am I going to do? I'm going to pack everything up. I'm going to try again. I'm going to start somewhere fresh. You've moved into a new country and it must have been difficult at first. Did you struggle to settle in? Did you struggle to find your rhythm? Or did you did you say, okay, this is this is where I'm going to go. I have an idea. I have a path. What was it like? Well, to be honest, Matt, like on the third day after well, was, I landed at London Heathrow and I was staying in a hotel because I didn't know anyone in the country. I literally had no one. So I just took a cab from Heathrow and I was like, just take me to the closest hotel. And it was Koinur Palace Hotel. I still remember the name to this day. Uh, on the third day, I was literally like, I think I made a mistake. I still have my return ticket. I should go back home. I should go back home. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was a journey. Or uh, it was a lot of ups and downs. But yeah, something I, I learned. It, it made me who I am today. And uh, yeah, lots of ups and downs. A lot of, uh, but it was all great experience overall. That's cool. Um, do you mind if I ask how old were you when you landed? 17. 17. Wow. Hey. 17 years old so that's that's a, a hell of a thing to do yeah at that age so but good for you good for you and since then you've made a success out of it i'm sure there have been some difficult spots along the way and we'll get into whatever you're comfortable with sharing but let's start after after university you went to university did you you studied did um when did your career sort of take off did you know what you wanted to do um was it up and down no so, so at the start obviously it was literally just about finding a job just about state afloat so you can pay the rent you can at least eat a meal a day and then if you have some savings left you save up for the uni fees because obviously that's as an international student you pay it it's, it's a pretty hefty fee so, oh, yes. so you gotta save up uh, whatever you can basically so at that point it was literally just okay i need a job any job will do and obviously uh, what i did um, I, I have I photocopied my CVs in a, in a uni library. I think 50 or 60 copies are made. And uh, literally on every Saturday and Sunday, I used to just go around my whole area from, I was living in Leytonstone at that time. So I one less so Saturday, I walk from Leytonstone to Leighton at every shop or anything that comes across, I'll drop a CV. If you're looking for someone, I'm here. I'll work, just pay me a pound an hour and I'll work, whatever. And Sunday, I'll take the other route. I go from Leytonstone to Wanstead, if you know the area. But uh, that's how I was doing, and I did come across, well, I did get a couple of odd jobs here and there, but it wasn't any permanent fix. And I like to train, I like to work out, so I joined the local gym. In our local gym, I found this guy who actually had a, a clothing store up in Woodgreen, and they were like, well, are you looking for work? I was like, yes, I am. I'll let you want to come and work for us. And that was £25 a day for 10 hours work, so £2.50 an hour, so more than what I was expecting. And that was my first proper three months job at, at that wow. time. And uh, again, I was applying online and I came across APCO, which was the first proper job, uh, proper job in the sense, like when I was going to uni to study, my, my, my uni mates were like someone working in KFC, some working in McDonald's, like, you know, just or been in a, at the, at the pubs and whatnot. And I was the only guy who was going to uni in a, in a suit, wearing a shirt and a tie. And my mates were like. What are you doing? Why are you wearing this? I was like, I've got to go to work after this. What you do for work? <laughs> like, I work in an office. And yeah, I got to dress in this. Um, so that was my first sort of exposure to uh, sort of proper sales uh, sort of uh, side of the business. Because uh, Apco was literally all about direct sales. So it was B2B, B2C at events. And I started working there. I learned a lot uh, from my time at Apco. Uh, I started building or learn how to build teams by the time I was 21. Uh, believe it or not so yeah that was again you can imagine like you, you need to go to uni at least three days a week mm -hmm. you also need to work so you finish your uni at three half three you get the train fast train back to liverpool street from chimsford and then you just rush to work basically you're just trying to make whatever you can in the last couple of hours and because it was sales role so obviously it was commission uh commission based as well so if i do end up doing a sale in the last hour or two that means I can still make twenty pound or twenty five pound in commission for the for the day as well. So every day was just a hustle to right get to uni, get to work, and then finish the uni homework when you come back home at night or midnight. Wow, Basically. that's you remind me of this that song here. Yeah. Every day I'm hustling. hustling. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. it. The three years were pretty much exactly the same. Like sometimes you even forget to eat. Sometimes you like right what the, what the day is. Mm. what's going on like you wake up on sunday you're just in a mode or oh, i need to go to uni i need to go to work oh it's sunday oh, i can take a break wondering why the bus is late <laughs> you're going you know at least at least every seven days the bus isn't on time 
TJ, it's Sunday, mate. Your neighbor's shouting, TJ, it's Sunday. <laughs> Go back to sleep. <laughs> Go to sleep. Yeah. Wow. But it, it looks like, and we'll get into it, but it looks like all of that paid off. And that life experience, that willingness to work, and the, and the, and the work ethic. Yeah. I think something important maybe, you know, that we can touch on there. Um, you hear a lot of stories, and I think every generation says about says it about the next one, but it sounds like you had that proper work ethic. Um, can't afford not to eat, can't afford to sleep outside, especially not in a cold and uh, miserable mm. UK. And, uh, but in? I had to. I did that as well. I had to sleep outside for two nights in February. Wow. Well, February? In February as well. It was snowing outside. I, was, I slept at Lady Stone train station. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you've been there. So you know all about it. And um, and you've managed to carve yourself something quite interesting through the years. Let me let's let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about um, crypto because that's something that pops up around your name yeah. um, quite a lot. Um, crypto, I think you know it's it it came out in what two thousand and eight somewhere around there. It started becoming yeah. two thousand nine. Yeah. Um, when was the first time you picked up on it? When did you notice it or start taking notice? All right. So this is an actual story, and I can even tell you the exact facts about this later on. But my school friend who I studied in India was told me about Bitcoin in 2010, back then. And he was like, just invest whatever you have. I didn't have anything. I was studying. Literally, whatever I had, it was for a, like wings and chips. It was three pounds yeah. for a meal deal. That's right, little pot pot noodle. <laughs> exactly, exactly, whatever you can. So I, I, I didn't really pay attention. Obviously, I try to look up online, but there was not much information. Long story short, that guy, my friend back then, he bought 19,000 Bitcoins in 2009. He still got them. Uh, yeah, he's um, he, he's very well off. But anyways, uh, I realized my mistake in 2014, and that's when I was like, right, you know what? I'm just going to... I'm just, it's, it's a big gamble. I'm going to take it. If it pays off, great. If it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. But I'd rather not be like, right, another four years' time. Oh, come on, TJ. Mm. You're a dumb idiot. <laughs> so in 2014, I got involved personally myself. And then I started to, okay, as in I started to take interest in it. It was something new. It was something that actually excited me because obviously it was fintech. I was in finance anyways. And now it, this is just a new sort of finance that came on a plate. So the first ever thing that excited me about it, that I remember sending money back home to India back in 2010 or 11 for the first time. And I remember Bank was telling me it would get there in four to five working days. And I was like, well, okay, fine, it is what it is, and you pay a fee. And I remember when I was reading up on blockchain and Bitcoin, that Bitcoin can do a money transfer within 13 hours. And I was like, wow, that's that's going to change something. And uh in the whole payment industry because if banks couldn't figure out how to make the payments faster and then this guy who just launched a white paper anonymous guy no one know who he is and he's claiming that it can be done in 13 hours of bitcoin that's something big and obviously that excited me and then i started taking more interest in an hour but two kids and even my son's studying bitcoin he's only six years old wow <laughs> yeah. that's in that's incredible i'm i know what it's like to kick yourself for um missing the boat um yeah. I was in a, a very similar situation also around 2011, 2012. And I was right. working with a guy and he was into computers. And, you know, he was one of these with towers and machines. And he would tell me, you know, the, the decimal points of the graphics card that he had in there. And he was like, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And I was like, nah, man, it's a scam. It's a scam. <laughs> so interesting stuff, interesting stuff. You got into it and... Um, you were also worked for eToro, and I know eToro Correct. is quite a big name. Um, tell us about your time there. Tell us about your 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 travels up and through this. Again, eToro, I don't, I don't think anyone needs an introduction on them. It's pretty big. They're, they're very well known around the world, actually. Uh, but yeah, the eToro journey, I started in 2019. And when I actually started, eToro wasn't that big of a name, believe it or not, because um, I started in UK. I was the... 14th person they hired in the uk and the whole company they had about i think six seven hundred people back then like that means the biggest soft images in israel and cyprus and combined all across the globe was only six seven hundred people and that the company valuation was around less than a billion dollar believe it or not 
And again, I, I got into it. And again, my, my excitement was that now I can work with something which I studied and I did for many years, which was traditional finance, like your stocks, your index firms, your currencies, and then crypto, which I got also interested recently in the last four or five years or six years. So like, right, now I can do both, which is fantastic. So it's like a win-win for me. But the experience with eToro, uh, I learned a lot because obviously that was the first, very first time where I inherited a team instead of building the team from scratch. So again, it was a learning curve. It was uh, it was the ups and downs. It was learning how to how to deal with the existing team, which you didn't hire, which you didn't start. It's not like your baby, but you're just going to mm-hmm. have to deal with it. You're going to have to learn how to love them or how to make sure they love you back as well. Um, it's another man's child. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I was a stepfather for them uh, that just joined in out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, but no, it was it was great. The team was five guys when I started, five or six guys, and I built that team, uh, the UK retention desk team, to twenty two guys at one point, uh, which was good. And again, I left eToro twenty twenty two, actually just last year. And when I left the eToro, just the UK office was around eighty people, and the company valued at over ten billion. So I think wow. I did play a. Uh, I play a small part in there, not a huge one, but small. But yeah, it was but it's absolutely it's an amazing thing to be a part of something like that. You know, yeah. um, something that no one can ever take away from you. Moving on, then um, coming up into your current position, tell us how you got there. How did every? How was this born? What is the situation? So this is the interesting one, right? So after I left eToro, I obviously got headhunted by uh, one of the biggest crypto exchange in Europe called uh, Zonda or BitBay. Um, you probably heard BitBay because they rebranded to Zonda. And everything was, I was I started off as global head of sales. And uh, the plan was that after 12 months, I would step into a CRO role. And it was all going fantastic. We opened up Italy, we opened up uh, France, two countries in a space of seven months. Uh, we expanded and just out of the blue, one of the founders of Phoenixio, uh, which happens to be a good friend of mine because I've worked with him in the past, he called me and he went like, listen, I got almost 300 people in the company. I just need someone to come in and like just make a sense of it because at the moment, yes, we're growing, but it's all over the place. I don't know what's going on. So I just want someone to just make a sense of it and obviously develop this into a sustainable structure thing. And I was like, listen... I <laughs> just about to go on holidays. It was July last year. It's like about to go on holidays and you can't just call me another blue. Let me come back uh, from holidays and let's meet up and let's have a chat. Long story short, we met up, we had a chat. I agreed that I will start and that's how I started in Phoenixio. It wasn't something I was actively looking. I wasn't looking to make that change from finance or fintech into digital marketing, but I guess it just everything was planned out beforehand and I was... I had to learn how the SEO works, I guess. So yeah, I'm here. That's cool. I like that. Um, sometimes it's it's about you know putting putting yourself out there, and if you're doing a good job, people are watching. I think people are always watching. People, and, always you know, watching. there's a reason they called you. They obviously knew what you were capable of, and they said, "I know the guy for this position." Well, uh, I'll tell you on that actually, just to share because I said I worked with them in the past, so I was working with that guy or with my current one of the founders uh, at Investu Times. And at that time, obviously, they saw me. I built the whole sales floor for them. Uh, we obviously took the, uh, what was that, the daily revenue of seventy to $80,000 to a million pound as well at one point on the on the peak time. So yeah, they've seen what I've done in the past, obviously, my, my work ethic, my craft, my ability to deal with people my, and how well I can run teams. And I think that's obviously played well in my favor and they decided to call me back. I love it. I love it. And uh, let's move on to your interactions and your actions with people. What are the people like? What is your what is your environment like now? Do you get to choose who you work with? Are you building your own teams now? Are you um, actively involved? Okay, now at sea level, it's very hard to obviously choose the, the sales guys or conversion guys I'm going to be working with because I'm not really involved in sort of that level of recruitment. So it's more like, right, I have a few guys who report into me who are the head of various departments, and then they deal with their recruitment, they deal with their departments as in who they need, how they hire and whatnot. And so far, it's been a good mix of people. Uh, I used to hire back in, like I said, I think after eToro, I stopped hiring as in personally, 
like I don't get involved in just a sales role. If it's a head of some department role, then I will be sitting in interview. Yeah, my questions in an interview and how I select people, like they completely vary. Some people call me like, you don't even talk about the role itself. You don't even talk about if they have the skill set. Um, my response to that is like, I don't really hire skill set. I hire like persona. I want a person mm. that if I can work with that guy, the skill set will come. I'm pretty sure they have half of it of what they said on the CV and the other half can be taught, but I can't teach someone a personality. It's just natural. Do you know what I mean? So I would rather choose personality over skill set. So that's why some people find that that's a very good approach. Others guys, nah, Mm. but it worked for me so far. So yeah. That's it. So I I like that quite a lot. And I've, I've noticed there is a bit of a trend or not, not a trend, but I'm hearing about it more often where people are saying they want people. There was a time, I think, where the humanity was being pulled out and it becomes very um, clinical and there's a lot of people that operate successfully like that. But there's a human element that seems to be coming back into into the business. And I don't know if it's a result of COVID, that we missed everybody, but it's a nice thing to hear. Oh, no, absolutely. And you're all... Yeah, absolutely. Sorry to cut you in there, but no, again, no. unless you're hiring for like, I don't know, a heart surgeon or a, a commercial air airline pilot role, which 100% needs to be skill oriented. I totally get it. Doesn't matter if they don't talk to you. It doesn't matter if they're the most grumpiest person on the planet, but you know that you get the job done. No one will die. Absolutely. But, well, it it would be nice to have a pilot who can make you smile in your final moments, you know. <laughs> don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you a joke on the way down. Just, that's just, <laughs> that just an added benefit. But uh, if you, <laughs> Are in like sales guys or marketing guys or biz dev guys or operations guys, just again, if you have the personality, if you got a mix of personalities in your team, the work would be a much more fun environment to come into every day instead of just everyone punching numbers like clock in, clock out. So you mentioned earlier that you are a family man. I think you said yeah. you have two children, I've right? Two kids, yeah. I've got a boy and a girl. Fantastic. And, uh, are you a busy man? Do you have time for your family? How are you finding a balance? What is your secrets there? What do you think? My daughter is two years old and I'm a C-level at a company and a board member. <laughs> so, but not much? No? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, uh, I would say I don't want uh, my, so it's a seven day work basically. Because obviously mm. the kids uh, stuff doesn't stop on a Saturday or Sunday where when I was obviously getting didn't have any kids when you just made a message well all right it's saturday or it's sunday yeah let's just lie down let's just sleep for another hour or two hours but it doesn't really happen now because kids get up around half six seven soon they get up you gotta get up anyway so yeah um especially now because with my work and stuff as well and i got teams that are remote they are in different countries different times and stuff as well so there's chances that i'm probably going to be end up working a few hours on a saturday and a few hours on sundays uh, sundays are more like right i'm just preparing for my week ahead and what's been happening in a week past. So time is good. I won't say it's, it's, it's uh, I don't have any time at all because obviously I'm working from home most of the time. So yeah. it works well in my favor that I can give some time to my family. I'm also available for my work if they need me any time of the day. Nice. I like that. So um, obviously as your, as your children get older, you know, they're going to put a bit more pressure on you there. So um, yeah. you got time to plan. And then, um, obviously, your decisions as well um, will have a big impact at work. Uh, Correct. You know, you mentioned 100 million people, 100 million impressions a month. So yeah. a small decision can have a far-reaching impact. Absolutely. You're going to have to stay sharp. Correct. How do you stay on the ball? Well, the best thing is, first of all, hire the people smarter than you. <laughs> that just makes your life easier. So, so yeah. It's true, Matt, because uh, what I heard from, again, some of the managers that I came across, I've worked in the past, they always live in this fear that if you hire people that are smarter than you, they're going to take your, they're going to take your job. But it's, it's, I look at the way, like, if I hire people smarter than me, it's going to make my job a lot easier. And if I can have, let's say, I'm hired, I hired a sales guy who's now a head of sales, who's running a team or is running the department. That's going to look good on my CV that I trained that guy in from nothing. Now he's running a team of 10, 15, 20 people. So the approach is slightly different. And yeah, by hiring smart people, you're just giving yourself a head start. Because again, my job is now, right, guys, we need to do this. 
on this side, on this page is, go get it done. Tell me how we can do it. And they will figure it out there. So now it's like, right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. Nice, I like that. Case, so it's not the case of, oh yeah, we need 100% perfection on the first go. That's never going to be the case. But as long as we can achieve the 100% perfection in a second or third go, that's good enough. That's it. So for me, I'm looking, I'm waiting for AI to get to a point where it can mimic me. Hopefully yeah. my voice, my reactions and the way that I speak and I can train it to take over my job so I can go sit on the beach and have a digital version of myself doing my work and I'll be very happy. You, you, you can already <laughs> do that. You can already do that. Uh, I believe so. I've just got to figure out how it works. I've heard a bit of talk about um, banks and I think particularly in America now that are busy experimenting with digital currency. Yeah. Um, I might be a bit further behind. You might know a lot more about this than I do, but what are your thoughts on uh, digital currency being um, rolled out to the general public through major banks? Right. So first of all, it is for all the listeners, if you are if you work for any of the regulators, like the non-disclaimer here, uh, in regards to the digital, digital currency, the digital assets, I'm all in favor of it because look at it this way. Do you know when was the first like the plastic card or debit card came out. No Any idea. idea? Do you want to give a guess? Um, 1986. 1960s. So the first ever plastic card was out in 1960s. But again, no one knows this. Cause for the first 10, 20 years, 30 years, even to this day in some countries, people don't like using plastic cards because they think, like, oh, that's bad. But they rather carry cash. And we know in a Western world, like now no one's carry cash nowadays. It's all cash. It's even contactless. We can even pay with our watches, let alone carry any cash in our pocket. So the digital currency, it is the next form of the what we're going to have as in a corner change or uh, how we're going to adapt into. Because at the moment, let's just talk basics here. So for a country to produce a one pound coin, let's call it for Bank of England, it costs them more than I think four or five quid. So the, all the hard labor, the metal and everything that goes, uh, let's talk about paper money. So for every time they produce a paper money and then someone just signs the name on it, the paper money has to, has to be, has to be gone. So they have to shred it and then replace it with a new paper money, which basically means an extra cost. With digital currency, none of that things actually will ever exist. So there is no cost of producing digital currency. First of all, it's a fixed supply. So there's not the case of where well, you're just going to print whatever you want, as many as you want, as, as often as you want. Like, We've heard about some countries doing that. Yeah. Oh, just print more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's just do it ourselves. Like, if normal people do it, they go to prison for very long. But if banks do it, it's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the official term, quantitative easing, we call it. But anyhow, so the digital assets, uh, it is it is the way forward. This is how it's going to happen. And just look at it like all the big universities uh, in the world, like your Harvards, your Cambridge, your Oxfords, they already introduce courses on blockchain or digital assets or how the smart contracts actually work hence i was telling my kids i gave him the book i was like listen you're gonna read you're gonna have to you're gonna have to learn this in a couple of years time as long as i start already now banks launching central or cbdc's that's something i'm not a huge fan of the reason being is the whole ethos or the motor the motive of blockchain was to be decentralized, that no one can control it. No central governments, uh, no banks can control it. It's owned by the people. But if mm. banks just going to launch their own digital currency, it's technically they are controlling it. So what we're seeing now happening in China, so they launched their, uh, their digital yuan, basically their CBDC, which basically means now that everything is controlled by the government. So if you... If you found out that you've been speeding, the money would be automatically deducted from your wallet. That's it. So they just have more control over your life than you think you have. Do you know what I mean? So banks launching their thing, I'm not a big fan of. I'm totally, I'm a big fan of digital currencies, blockchain itself, the the, the technology and the DeFi. How is it going to work? How is it going to change the world in the next 5, 10, 20 years? Banks, on the other hand, I'm not a big fan of. Yep. I understand that. Thank you. It's nice to have a bit of a professional insight on that, um, especially for people like myself. You know, these these things scare me and I don't know enough about them. Um, but what I did find uh, interesting or, or entertaining, actually, I found it all interesting. But what I found yeah. entertaining was that you brought up speeding. And that, funny enough, is something that a lot of people mention. And I myself said it 
quite yeah. recently. I said, well, if the bank's got my money digitally, they can just take it off every time I go speeding. Yeah. And I'm, I'm starting to figure out more than anything that there are a lot of speeders in the world. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want digital currency. We want to speed. <laughs> No, digital currency is good, but if if it's if it's controlled by again a central government or a bank, then it's that is no use. Then it's bad, yeah. It's exactly <laughs> the same thing. Then we have to drive on the speed limit. So <laughs> yeah. you can't do anything. You can't progress or speeding. What do we do? <laughs> it's, actually, oh. it's actually funny because I was watching this interview with this lady in Australia, and she wanted to just take some money out from the bank, and the bank refused it. They said, "Sorry, we don't have it." She wanted like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars out of her the bank, and the banks were like, "Sorry, we don't have it. We're cashless. We don't keep any cash on the premises." And she was like, "What do you mean? Where's my money? I need my money. I need to pay for something." And they were like, "Well, you can make a request and come back in a week, and we will have it delivered." That's it. I've heard about yeah. So your money, your money is in the bank. <laughs> you, you think your money's in a bank, but it doesn't actually exist. It yes. only exists on your screen. That is yeah. The closest you have is that piece of paper with the number printed on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's all you got. You got nothing. Whereas oh. With the digital wallet, you have the keys. It's your wallet. You control it. I like that. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you one or two little uh, things just to finish us off quickly. Sure. If you can tell me, do you have a motto, um, a saying? I did see one on um, on your LinkedIn. Yes, was that yeah. by a, a famous singer? Uh, it's from Maya Angelou. Yes. Maya Angelo, yeah, that's right, Maya Angelo. Yeah, just do it in style, basically. Are those words the words to live by? That is because again, you got to realize corporate world is hectic. Uh, managing a family even more hectic. So if you can do it with style, it will at least put a smile on your face. That's uh, very very cool. And then um, last but not least. Any, um, do you have a role model? Is there a person you look up to? Is there a person you would recommend? Maybe a book that we can read, um, something we can follow, uh, somebody that's inspired you? Again, I look up to my dad quite a lot. Um, so the work ethic part that you mentioned earlier, he actually came from my dad itself as well, because he's a very hardworking man. Uh, when I was growing up, obviously he, he was a banker himself. He, he retired now, but, uh, Back in the days when I was growing up, he was working six days a week. So banks used to operate Monday to Saturday, believe it or not. Um, so obviously I look I look up to him that he's working six days, not just till Friday. So when I came here and some of us have to work on a Saturday, another goes like, oh, but it's a weekend for me. It was like, but you work Saturdays. What do you mean? So <laughs> yeah, it was easy. But in regards to book, I do read a lot of books. I, I read a lot of business books. Uh, I read a lot of books about uh, on uh, or from Warren Buffett, which is again one of the the pinnacles when it comes to investing in a stock market, how to invest. So, if you can pick up again, you don't even need to read books nowadays. You can just have an audio book or just obviously listen to podcasts like this. And uh, his tips are usually pretty pretty good. Uh, I read uh, a lot of books from uh, Robert Kiyosaki. The Rich Dad Poor Dad is like it's, it's a fantastic book. That's one of the very first books I read uh, back in the uni time, believe it or not. Uh, one of the books that I really like is from Dr. Stephen, I forgot his last name, but the book called The Chimp Paradox. Dr. Stephen Peters, there you go. Uh, the Chimp Paradox, which is really good. Uh, it basically helps you gain a bit of control over your logical mind than your emotional mind. So if you want to read it, take a read on that as well. Um, one of the book I just finished recently was what they don't teach you at Harvard. Again, another fantastic book. And it's, it's really, really good actually. Uh, cause one of my long-term plan is uh, back home to open a school, but not just tradition, like this traditional school, but to open a school, teach the kids, the skills, what they don't teach in school or colleges or unis, basically mm -hmm. like Norman taught us about taxes when we we're back in there. So like, oh yeah. <laughs> It doesn't matter how much you make, you're never going to keep that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no one told us about how the trust funds work. No one told us about how the investing works. Oops. No one told us about any of that. No financial literacy, no tax literacy. And that's it. No sell stuff because you're going to be selling on a day to day basis. Doesn't matter what your position is, doesn't matter what you do, whether it's your marketing, operations, pharmacy, medical, whatever sector, you're going to be selling on a day to day basis. It's a sales skill. So, that book is actually very, very good, and that's something I wanted to do as well. So yeah, I do read a lot of business books. Nice. I like that. And I think, um, touching on that, I think there's a conspiracy 
I think it's a, a it's a running practical joke to not teach um, learners about taxes because everyone that I know that got their first pay slip, their first reaction is always, "What's this big minus here, <laughs> my friend?" <laughs> Let me tell you about that 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 <laughs> deduction, <laughs> and they, and they all go, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is this new? Uh, how long has this been going on for? Yeah. So yeah, I think it's a big practical joke. It's like a rite of passage. Don't yeah. tell them what's coming. Let's just wait and see their reaction. You know <laughs> exactly. Because what they taught us in school is like, oh yeah, get a good job and save. And but when you actually go to the real world, you do realize. Savings not going to do anything. Like you can't save yourself to rich. It's not going to work. So it's all about investing. But again, those sort of things no one teaches us in uh, schools or unis and stuff. And just something you learn either on your own or if you're lucky enough to have a friend from the industry. That's it. And if yeah. you don't ask questions, if you're not the kind of person to ask yeah. questions, you will never learn the terminology. Yeah. When someone's exactly. talking about uh, return on investment and compound interest and whatever yeah. the case is, and you're going. Mm. Yeah, no idea. Missing the boat completely. Invest in Bitcoin, and you're going whatever, man. It's a scam. <laughs> Mate, I, I tell you, like the amount of uh, the the. So back in the days in India, obviously I grew up, and I got beaten by my teacher of not doing the the algebra right. And I was like, I swear to God, I never use algebra in my real life. Like, they never told me Excel, and I use Excel on a day to day basis. Yeah, and Excel was around, eh? Um, got Windows, Windows 98, you know, these programs were coming out. I still had another four or five years in school, you know, to get into the swing. Also, it's all taught Excel, so missed a few boats there. Um, also, grew up in South Africa, so I know all about how the teachers used to um, encourage us, you know, back in the, back in the <laughs> early 90s. <laughs> a nice way to put in it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, TJ. So look, thank you so much. It's been a it's been a great pleasure to meet you, to chat with you. I've had a good laugh with you today. And I just want to say best of luck in the future. Thank you again for sharing um your story with us. Um, no your story about resilience, bouncing back, um, you know, work ethic. Um, we really do appreciate it and I appreciate your honesty and your openness. Thanks very much, Matt. It's been a pleasure. And thanks for having me. Awesome, TJ. See you later. Thank you, Matt. Cheers, man. Bye bye.